All right, so today we're going to um, take a look at 7.4, okay, which is a little bit different than the last couple sections we did. We were really heavily dependent on the calculator in 7.3 to find roots and intersects, things like that. Um, today is going to be more algebra, okay, using trig identities. So first thing I just want people to remember is what an identity is. Okay, so an identity is basically an equation that is true for all values of the variable. Okay, here's an algebraic identity. Uh, that's an algebraic identity. If you try to solve that, you're going to end up when you distribute on the left is 3x plus 3 plus 1. So on the left you have 3x plus 4. On the right you have 3x plus 4. So if you subtract 3x from each side, you get 4 equals 4. Okay, that's a true statement, which means there's infinitely many solutions. Okay, so this is an equation that works for any value of x. We're going to be looking at a similar idea, except we're going to have trig functions in it. Okay, trig functions, um, basically, that give us identities. Right, so we need to already be familiar with the reciprocal tangent, cotangent, and Pythagorean identities, and all the different ways we can rearrange them. All right. So we talked, those are reciprocal, tangent, cotangent, Pythagorean. And we can also use the identities for higher powers. So if you flip the sine, you get the cosecant. If you flip sine squared, you get the cosecant squared. If you flip sine cubed, you get cosecant cubed. In general, we're not going to have to go very high. But the rest of all the identities I've listed right here work for higher powers. Um, the Pythagorean identities do not. Okay, you got sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. You can't say sine cubed plus cosine cubed equals one. Um, can't just cube everything and say that it's going to work. Okay, so those Pythagorean identities, pretty much what you see, that's all we've got. All right, so this is just a couple identities that I showed you on the other page the tangent, cotangent, and the Pythagorean. If you need them, they're all on page 403. And there, we'll look at them on the board, too. So one reason why we might um, use trig identities, especially next year, uh, is to make an expression that looks really complicated simpler. Right? Just like when we did those um, problems in section 7.2, we had like the sine of the inverse tangent. We had a way to simplify that and make it algebra rather than trig, so we could work with it a little easier. Well, similar idea. We're going to just try to simplify expressions to make them easier to work with. Okay, several tricks that we'll learn as we go through. And one trick is to change everything in the problem that's not a sine or a cosine into a sine or cosine. Now, that's kind of just a, that's a guideline. It's not mean, it doesn't mean you should do that in every problem. In fact, there's a problem today we're going to do uh, later on where if you try to do this, it will work, but it actually makes it harder. Okay. So I'll, I'll point that out. But as a general guideline, this trick can work a lot of the time. Okay. Change everything to sines and cosines. Right, so here's our, our first problem. It says cotangent divided by cosecant. Okay, we want to try to simplify that. So what we'll do is change everything in that expression to sines and cosines. Okay, let's start with um, cotangent. Okay, how can you rewrite cotangent so that it's just sines and cosines? Nick? Cosine, cosine. Yeah, it's cosine over sine. Good. Okay. And now in the denominator, we have got cosecant. How can we rewrite that using sines or cosines? Josh? One over sine. Yeah, that's one over sine. Now what happens there when we divide those two fractions? Yeah. The sines are going to cancel out. Okay. Some people think of it as take the one in the bottom, flip it. Multiply by the one in the top. Well, if you flip the one in the bottom and put it in the top, you get sine over one. 
the signs would cancel. Okay, so the denominators are the same, they cancel out. Um, what am I left with? Just cosine. So if somebody asked you to take the cotangent of any angle and divide it by the cosecant of the same angle, that's the same as just taking the cosine. Right? And that expression is a lot easier to work with than that one. Okay, any questions on that? All right, so that's, that's a very easy identity. Okay, that's considered probably a very, very easy one. Pretty much two steps, and then you're done. All right, let's try... Let's try this one. This one also is, is pretty straightforward. It would be considered kind of an, an easy one. And all we really want to do is the same trick we did last time. Let's try changing everything to sines and cosines. Okay, start with cosecant. Uh, how about Michael? What's the um, cosecant if we write it as sine and cosine? One over sine? Yeah, just one over sine. Times, okay, tangent, T. Sine over cosine? Yep, that's sine over cosine. And when you multiply these fractions together, you have sine in the top, sine in the bottom. That cancels. So I'm left with 1 over cosine. But I could even simplify that a little bit more so it's not a fraction. Okay? So you could kind of make an argument. Is it better to just stop here? Or kind of go one more step? Um, I would go one more step. So what is 1 over cosine? Cosecant? Uh, 1 over cosine? Um, Wait, secant. Yeah, it's the secant. And that's it. So if you take the cosecant of an angle times its tangent, you're just going to get the secant of it. Any questions on that one? Yes? If you had to actually evaluate something on the calculator, yeah. that's how you'd have to evaluate it, yes. In terms of writing it down on paper, though, um, my argument here would be secant doesn't have a fraction, and this does, so this is simpler on paper. Okay. There's two types of problems. We're going to do simplify and we're going to do verify. Simplify is a little harder because they just start you off with something and you've got to simplify as much as you can and kind of guess when you're done. Verify, they start you with, basically it's an equation. They give you something on the left, they give you something on the right, and you have to show that the left and the right match. So you kind of you know where to start, you know where to stop, you just have to fill in the steps in the middle. Okay, so verify is a little bit easier knowing where to stop. We'll, we'll try some of those in a little bit. Okay, next one's going to be a little different. I don't want you to verify that it's true. I want you to show me that it's not true. Okay, in general, showing that an equation is not true um, can be a lot easier than trying to prove it is true. Anybody remember how you can show something is false? You learned about this in um, geometry. To prove that something's false, you need to show one, one of what this thing is. I can't tell you the name. I'm trying to get you to say that. You show one thing, and this one thing has a special name. Well, how would you do it if it was just an algebraic equation? If you had an algebraic expression on the left, you had one on the right, and I said, prove to me that these are not equal. You know, something like you know, x squared plus 1 equals x cubed minus 8. How could you prove that? Just prove they're not the same. You find a variable that makes the equation not true. Can you say, say it one more time? You find an equation that would make the, uh, I mean, well, you find a value for the variable that would make the equation not true. Yeah, find one specific value that you can plug in for the variable and show that the left and the right come out different. Does anybody remember what that's called when you find an, an example that shows something is false? Yeah? Is it a contradiction? Um, 
Yeah, it, it, so the answer here would be a contradiction. Like if you plug in one on each side, it would be a contradiction. But it, the thing that you plugged in, the one is called a... No, nope, not extraneous solution. It's a good guess, but it's called a counterexample. Okay, a counterexample is used to show something is false. So in this case, easiest way to do it, um, if you don't have a graphing calculator, you don't need one. But if I can use the table, it's a little faster. So got one plus sine squared okay, divided by cosine squared. And put in what do we have on the other side? Cosine. Now, we should be careful when we pick a number to use as a counterexample. Uh, what do you think I should avoid? What number? What numbers might be not good counterexamples to use? Yeah? Yeah, zero. Sometimes special things happen with zero. Sometimes one is a little too simple. Things can, things can happen. Like if I said to you, prove x squared is different than x cubed, well, if you try zero, that works. If you try one, that works. So you gotta try something other than zero or one. All right. Let's try, um, actually you can see what happens here. If you try zero, zero does work. But let's pick something different. So we just showed using a counterexample that if you plug in 2, you get 10.5 in y1, and you get negative 0.42 in y2. You get different values. So that's not true. It's OK. So the idea is show a counterexample. Okay, so any question on um, that counterexample? All right. In fact, I think if you try this other values where they do come out the same, like if you happen to try, well, not pi, not pi over 2. Let's try 3 pi over 2. 2 pi. There it is. There's another one. So if you happen to try 2 pi as a counterexample, it doesn't work. Okay. In fact, if you look at the graph, let's see what this looks like. Okay, so there's what's on the left, and there's what's on the right. So these graphs keep intersecting each other over and over at different points. But most points, if you pick any random number for a counterexample other than 0 or 1, most of the time you're going to be okay. Just try not to pick something special like those two. All right, so the next um, type of problem I told you about, that's verify. Okay, so when they ask you to verify an identity, they're going to give you an equation. Not an expression to simplify, but an equation. And the idea is you usually want to start with the more complicated side and make it look like the simpler side. It's easier to take something that's complicated and simplify it rather than take something that's already simple and complicated. That, that's harder to do. Okay, sometimes you can also work with both sides at the same time to prove an identity. Um, I think for most problems I do today, I'm going to stick with one side and just keep doing substitution and different tricks to make it look like the other side. Okay, so a second trick that we can use uh, to simplify identities is to find a common denominator. finding a common denominator. Okay, let me show you um, an example of what a, uh, a verify problem looks like. Let's see if I got one. Okay, so actually we'll do one more simplify and then there's a verify. Okay, you get something on the left, something on the right. Start with the more complicated side and we'll change it into the simpler side. Okay, but again, at least with the verify, you know where to start, you know where to stop. Unlike simplify, you just keep going until it looks as simple as you think it is. It's as simple as you can make it. 
Right. In uh, example four, what, what property do you think we're going to end up using? We haven't used it yet today, but you use it all the time in algebra. Algebra one, algebra two, and you can use it here. Yeah. Okay. Distributive. Yeah, we're going to do the distributive property. Okay, so we're going to write sine times cotangent plus sine times tangent. Oops, fix that. Once we distribute it, we can get rid of the parentheses. Okay, so we have sine times cotangent plus sine times tangent. What, um, what do you think I should do next? Done my distributive property. Marina? Use trig identities to rewrite cotangent. Okay. Cotangent. How would you rewrite cotangent? Uh, um, you could. Co that is an identity. Cotangent is 1 over tangent. But if you rewrite it, a different way, we're going to have something nice happen. We can get something to actually cancel in the next step. And that's the tricky part about identities. You almost have to know what you want to happen in the next step, and you have to do that in the previous step to make that happen. It's kind of like playing chess. You kind of have to know where you want to go to make that happen. Yeah. Cosine over sine. Yeah, right? This cosine over sine. Now we're going to get the sines to cancel out. Now let's do the same thing with this one. I don't think we're going to get quite the same result, but we have sine over 1 times sine over cosine. So now this just becomes cosine plus, what does the second part become? Sine squared over cosine. It becomes sine squared over cosine. And we're not, quite, we're not quite done. We've got everything in terms of sine and cosine. So using that trick won't help here. What else could I do? Nick? Multiplying both of them cosine. When you say both of them, which, what do you mean? The, Okay, now why are you doing that? What's your thought? Um, because of the Pythagorean identity. Okay, we do want to get a Pythagorean identity here, and, and he's definitely on to the right track because we see a sine squared. But let me give you a hint at how to s describe what we want to do a little bit better. Does that hint help anybody? Yeah? I want to find a common denominator. Yeah, I want to find a common denominator. All right. This fraction on the right isn't going to change. I don't have to multiply it by anything because it already has the denominator that I need. Okay, the common denominator here is going to be cosine. But we still have to multiply the other one to make that have the common denominator. And then we're going to get the Pythagorean identity that, that Nick just mentioned. Um, so this is cosine. Sine squared is okay. What do you have to multiply top and bottom by in the fraction on the left to make it have that denominator of the cosine? Okay. One over cosine? I mean cosine? Yeah, just cosine. Cosine in the top, cosine in the bottom. What would you get if you do that? Uh, cosine squared over cosine. Yep, cosine squared. And we already have over cosine. Now, we already recognize this as a Pythagorean identity. Cosine squared plus sine squared, what is that? Yeah. One. It's one. We wrote it as sine squared plus cosine squared, but it's just a commutative property to switch the order. So now you get this. And I would go one more step with that. Yeah? Secant? That's secant. Not every identity simplifies down that nicely, but this one did. So we started out with something that looked really complex. We end up with something very simple, just secant. Yes, that's more of a medium one because you had to use uh, a few different identities, the Pythagorean, the reciprocal, 
common denominator and distributive property. Okay. Any questions on that one? All right. So let's try a uh, verify. Okay, so verify, my suggestion is to start with the more complicated side, try to make it look like the simpler side. If you do it that way, you can try to cancel things out till you get your result. Okay, I think in this case it's pretty clear which side looks more complicated. What's on the left or what's on the right? Yeah, what's on the right? Okay, so let's um, start with what's on the right. On the left-hand side, it's going to stay sine theta the whole time. Hopefully by the time I'm done on the right, I have sine theta. That's the goal. Any thought what I do with this first? Um, it's not really too many options here. Yeah? Make everything close to Yeah, let's try to make everything cosines and sines and, and see what happens. So secant is 1 over cosine. Tangent is sine over cosine. And cotangent is cosine over sine. All right, so the first step, we didn't really make anything better. I think we made it worse. Now we have all these fractions everywhere. But sometimes it does look a little bit more complicated before it starts to simplify. OK, any um, suggestions what I do here? There's a couple different things you could try. I'm not sure either way is going to be faster, but yeah. Okay, yeah, we could do that. We could do the common denominator in the bottom. Um, so keep, keep the top the same. And Josh, can you tell me what, what is my common denominator in the bottom? Sine times cosine. Yeah, it's sine times cosine. So sine times cosine. Okay, so Brian, what do we have to multiply this fraction on the left by to make it have that common denominator? Well, if you're going to multiply this fraction by something, it's got to be the same thing in the top and the bottom. Otherwise, you change the fraction. It's like if I said, okay, you've got this. Um, and your common denominator is, uh, would that be 24? Is there anything smaller? No. 24. And you said, well, just multiply this fraction by 1 over uh, 8. Well, if you multiply 2 thirds by 1 eighth, now you've changed the original fraction. But instead of multiplying 2 thirds by 1 eighth, you could multiply by what? You still want to get the denominator at 24, but you can't. What's the only thing you can multiply a fraction by and it won't change? Think about, think about the number you could multiply anything by and it stays the same. It never changes. One. Okay, so you've got to multiply by one. So anyone help them out? How would you... If you want to multiply by 1, what does that mean about your fraction? You've got to have the same thing in the top and on the bottom, okay, to find a common denominator. All right, so now here, we're definitely going to multiply the bottom by sine. So that, that part was good. So we got that. But we also have to multiply the top by what? Carly? Well, we can't multiply top and bottom by different things because yeah. then, then it's going to change our fraction. Whatever we multiply the bottom by, we've got to multiply the top by. Sine. sine. So you're going to multiply by sine over sine. Right. What about in my other fraction? 
Still going to multiply top and bottom by the same thing. But I want to get a denominator of sine times cosine. Yep. Cosine over cosine. Very good. Okay, it's our common denominator. That's already taken care of. We're going to get sine times sine. Sine squared. Plus cosine times cosine. That's cosine squared. It still doesn't look that much better, but it's about to start looking better. Anybody notice uh, something there? Sylvia? Sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. Yeah, this whole thing right here becomes a one. That's a Pythagorean identity. So now I have one over cosine divided by one over sine cosine. Okay, how can I handle dividing uh, a fraction by a fraction? What do you do with the one in the bottom? Yeah. You flip it. You flip it and multiply by the one in the top. So you have one over cosine times, flip that, you get sine over cosine in the top, one in the bottom. And now you've got cosine and cosine. And what's the only thing that I'm... I'm left with sine. Now we've got to go back up and make sure that that's what they wanted you to try to get. It's exactly what they wanted. So I proved that the right-hand side is equal to the left. OK, any questions on that one? OK, so this is the kind of thing. Some people really like it because it's it's different. It's not, you're not doing calculations. You're not really trying to, it's not like a proof in geometry. It, it's totally different. Um, some people just, this kind of thing, it's really hard for them to get the hang of. Um, it, it just takes practice. It's one of those things to, to practice. Okay, so the third, third trick, and pretty much our last trick that we're going to use, um, is to multiply by conjugates. Okay, we've used conjugates in a few different places. Okay, anytime you have complex arithmetic, like the way you solve that problem is to multiply top and bottom by 4 minus i. And that cancels the imaginaries from the bottom. Okay, so we're not, we're not really dealing with complex numbers, though. We're going to deal with trig functions. What do you think the conjugate of 3 plus cosine is? Um, not, not quite. We don't have to get too, you went a little bit too far. A little bit, a little bit too complicated. Um, just 3 minus cosine, yeah. So if you have 3 plus cosine, the conjugate is 3 minus cosine. 4 plus tangent, 4 minus tangent. Okay? So you just change the sign of the second term. Now you could do a conjugate in the top or you could do a conjugate in the bottom. We only did it in the bottom before, but we might do it in the top. Let's see what happens. Is there any question on what a, what a conjugate is? And it's pretty obvious when you need to use that trick. Like here. Uh, if you look at what's on the left, look at what's on the right. You have one minus sign on the left. You have one plus sign on the right. They're conjugates. So it makes perfect sense to use that trick to try to change the left side into the right. Or you could change the right side into the left. Um, I would argue these are both the same level of difficulty, complexity. Doesn't matter which side you start with. Okay, does anybody have a, a preference which side they wanna wanna start with? Well, Lasan, what's your favorite side, left or right? Um, In this equation, you like left side. You think the left side is harder? Yeah. How come? Because the conjugate is Okay. This side has a conjugate in the numerator. Yeah, I mean, they both have conjugates. They both have one part of the fraction. That's just a single trig term. Um, 
they're, they're pretty similar. But yeah, we can start with the left. It okay? Does, doesn't matter. Okay, so let's take that over 1 minus i. And the right-hand side will stay the same. Okay, we're just going to try to change the left side. Okay, so what would be my first step here? Josh? Multiply top and bottom by 1 plus sign. Exactly. Multiply top and bottom by 1 plus sign and 1 plus sign. Notice I'm, a couple times I've gotten a little sloppy and left my argument off. A lot of times when people do these kind of proofs, they do leave the arguments off and just do it with trig functions. Okay, but I'm trying to be formal about it. Okay, so in the top, don't distribute out cosine, just leave it. And the reason why is because I know something's going to happen in the bottom, just looking at that. All right, so for the top, I'm just going to leave it as cosine t times 1 plus sine t. Now, what do you get when you do this out in the bottom? You have to use your double distributive property. Uh, how about Shannon? What's the first thing I would do? For which one? Uh, to do out the bottom. Okay, so you do one times, yep, one times one gives me one. What's the next thing you multiply? One times sine. Yep, one times positive sine, so that gives me sine. Uh, Brandon, what's the next thing you multiply? Negative sine. Yep, negative sine and one, so that's going to cancel out what Shannon just said. One times sine, one times negative sine. Okay, and now the last part, um, Julia, what's negative sine times positive sine? Negative sine squared. Okay, now from here, there's something you have to recognize. What do you recognize something there? It's something that's written on this page but it's not written exactly the way it's written here. But it's basically right there. Yep? Couldn't you break apart the denominator and then have it uh, uh, one of the... No, never mind. Wait. So give you a hint. Our next step is substitution. We're going to change something there to something else we're going to change it to has to do with something on that page right there. Let me see it. Nick? It's equal to cosine squared with diagonal Yeah. What's in the bottom here? 1 minus sine squared? If you brought sine squared to the other side, 1 minus sine squared would equal cosine squared. Very good. All right, so that whole bottom becomes cosine squared. And now maybe you can see why I didn't foil out the top. So look at what's going to happen there. Okay, what can I do now? About the tahina? You can um, Complete, um, no, we don't have to complete the square. It's only if we were like solving a quadratic. We actually are going to do that when we get to chapter 8, though, um, solving trig equations. So, but not, not for this. There's something there that cancels out because it's common to the top and bottom. The cosine and the cosine squared. Yeah, how many cosines can I cancel out? Mm -hmm. Just one. Cancel one from the top, cancel one from the bottom. And look at what I'm left with. 1 plus sine over cosine. Go back up and see what they wanted you to get. 1 plus sine over cosine. Okay, exactly what they wanted. And that's it. Okay, so there you had to recognize to use the conjugate. 
make sure you foil and distribute all that correctly. Then use a Pythagorean identity, and then cancel out a common factor from the top and bottom. Okay, any question on that one? Okay, uh, I'm not going to go through this whole problem, but what strategy do you think I would use here? This is pretty much the exact same problem as the one we just did. In terms of the structure of how you're going to solve this problem, there is nothing different about it. You're going to multiply, you're going to pick one side, whichever one you want, and multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of whichever side you pick. So if you start with the left, you're going to multiply top and bottom by cosecant plus one, and then you're going to get a Pythagorean identity. In this case, you're going to get the one that has the um, cosecant squared and the 1 in it. Um, last one. The cosecant squared and the 1. Notice it has the cotangent. The problem I gave you has a cotangent in it, so one of them is going to cancel out, just like the last one. Any questions on how you do that? It's not really different, so we'll, we'll skip that one. This one. Okay, this is one that when I did it yesterday, we got it, but it, um, it took about 10 steps. And it was pretty, pretty confusing, all the stuff we had to do. And some of the stuff we did, and then later on we had to undo. So if you do something in a problem, like change to sines and cosines, and then you have to undo that later on, that's not, not good. You probably did something to start out with, that you shouldn't have done. So changing to sines and cosines here will work, but it's very difficult. Okay? It takes about 10 steps. There's another trick. I can do this whole problem in probably three steps. Anybody have a, a suggestion besides changing to sines and cosines? We haven't, I don't think we've used this identity yet today, but it, it was on the other other page. I think somebody suggested it once, but we never used it. Well, as another hint, why don't we start with the right-hand side? Okay. Start with the right-hand side. And we'll try to change it into the left. Yeah? Yeah, let's change everything to tangent. Okay? So we're going to have tangent minus 1 over tangent. And then we're going to have tangent plus 1 over tangent. And my hint, if nobody got that, was going to be how would you graph this? Think about how would you type that in if you were going to graph it. You'd have to type it in just like this. Okay. Anybody have a thought what we can do now? Our next step, if we get the right step, is going to give us this entire numerator. So think about how could you force this to turn into tangent squared minus 1. I'll give you a hint. There's a hint. Yeah? So you multiply everything by tangent. Multiply everything by tangent. Okay, now that's not specifically a trick I taught you, multiply everything by tangent. It's just that's what's going to work here. Okay. And watch how easy. Uh, we have one step. We'll simplify this, and then we're pretty much done. So if you distribute that out, you get tangent times tangent. 1 divided by tangent times tangent. Tangents cancel out, and I get just a 1. My entire numerator is what I want. So I wouldn't mess with the numerator anymore, because it's where you want it. Now we just have to mess around with the denominator. Okay, we have tangent times tangent. And then 1 over tangent times tangent plus 1.
So leave the, leave the numerator alone. What about the denominator? Anybody recognize that? Yeah? Um, no, the denominator is not secant. If it was, we'd have a problem because we really we don't want to get secant in the bottom. We want to get secant squared. So the question is, this is secant squared. Why? How? Yeah. Yeah, it's a Pythagorean identity. Uh, one plus tangent squared equals secant squared. Okay, and that's exactly what we have here. Just a commutative property. Switch the one and the tangent squared. Okay, so that's Pythagorean identity number. On your sheet, it was number two. So we get secant squared. And that's it. Now, if you saw how we did this yesterday in the other class, you'd think this is 100 times easier, and it is. Changing to sines and cosines here is an awful idea. And I think about five minutes in, you realize that, because it's getting worse and worse. And then you have to change it back from sines and cosines. Plus, look at the final answer. Does the final answer that you wanted have any sines and cosines? No. So maybe somehow you could change to sines and cosines and things would work out. But the final answer had a lot of tangents and secant squareds. So try to keep the tangents in the problem, because that's what you want in the final answer. Don't get rid of them. OK? So actually, that one turned out kind of an easier one. It wasn't too bad. Any question on that one? Okay, we'll, um, we'll try maybe one or two more. At, at some point, they're all pretty much the same. You just have to figure out which techniques you use to solve it. Um, so let me just put up some different ones, and we can pick one. Okay, so we got that one on page 34. Um, example 9, that's a little different. That's using a graphing calculator to support the claim that what's on the left and what's on the right matches. You don't have to use algebra in this one. If what's on the left and right matched, and you graph them, it's going like to look like the same line. That's how you'd support that claim. Now, if you graph it and they look like the same line, does that prove it? No. The only way to prove it is the way we've been doing it with algebra. But if you graph it and the two lines are right on top of each other, there's a good chance that what they're suggesting here is probably true. So the graphing calculator is a good tool to use. Like if you're in college, you get an identity, and somebody says, we're not even going to tell you if it's true or not. You have to first figure out, do you think it's true? And then if it is true, try to prove it. Right? So I would graph what's on the left in a calculator, graph what's on the right, see if they look the same. And then if they do, I'd go from there and try to prove it. If they look totally different, then I'd say, I'd find a counterexample and prove they're different. Okay. That would be easier. Yeah? Yeah, that's the one where we have the Pythagorean identity. Yeah. Well, anytime you multiply by a, Pythag by a conjugate, you're usually going to get something squared. So I looked at that. I knew I was going to get a 1. And I'm thinking, there's probably going to be a Pythagorean identity that this turns into. And the only Pythagorean identity that has 1 minus sine squared also has cosine in it. And then there was also a cosine in the top. So yeah, it's just practice and, and getting good at it. If you did FOIL it out, what would happen is you would then be canceling it out what you just FOILed. It would have been a waste of time. But you could, you could have still done it. Um, so, any question on this um, calculator one? Kind of how you use a calculator to assist you to figure out is it true, is it false, and then go from there. Yeah? Is there a case that the lines match up, but they don't exactly equal the same thing? Yeah. Yep. Like if I gave you, um, say I gave you something from algebra that had a hole in the graph. Remember that? They look the same, but there's a hole that you can't see. That'd be an example from algebra where they're not exactly the same. There's a removable discontinuity. Kind of be like this. Um, if 
I said graph that, and graph that. Those aren't exactly the same. They're very close, except that negative 1, there's a hole in this one, but not this one. So something like that would be very tough to spot. You'd have to know the algebra a little bit to figure out if there was a hole or something like that. Um, so we get that one. Okay, we could try that one or that one. And those are our choices. So you want to look at yeah, number 20, number 10, or number 34. Let's get rid of number 9 because we just talked about that. So 34, 10, or 20. 10? 20. 20? 34, all of them? Uh, all right, well, why don't we, why don't we try, um, why don't we try 10? Okay, let's try that one. See how we do. Okay, it just says to simplify. So simplify is a little trickier. We don't know what we're supposed to get. We're just going to keep going until we think we got it as simple as we can. Any um, suggestions what I try first here? Yeah? Uh, no, because they're not common terms everywhere. Like if you had you know, 3 plus 2 over 3 plus 2 minus 4, you can't, you can't do that. Yeah. Now, if you had, let's say, secant x plus secant tangent x divided by secant x plus secant tangent x minus secant cosine x, then secant was common everywhere, and you could cross it out from everywhere. Uh, but that's, that's a good guess. But we can't, we can't try that. Okay. Any, um, any other thoughts that we could try? Yeah. Yeah, I guess we could try changing everything to sines and cosines, look at common denominators. Hopefully something cancels somewhere. Um, changing to sines and cosines could lead to a long process, but we won't know until we give it, a, give it a shot. So we got 1 over cosine plus sine over cosine. Well, that actually worked out nice. We already have a common denominator just by changing to sines and cosines. Okay, and in the bottom, let's see, we got three things. So we got 1 over cosine plus sine over cosine. And we have minus cosine. Right, I'm going to write that with a common denominator as well. If you write, if you just multiply top and bottom of cosine over 1 by cosine, you get cosine squared over cosine. So now we have all common denominators everywhere. Okay. Any thought what I do, what I could do now? Use this this trick in one of the earlier problems, because we we have denominators of cosine everywhere. So what could I multiply top and bottom by here that would clean up a lot of these fractions? Yeah, if you multiply top and bottom by cosine over cosine, that's going to cancel cosine from every denominator. Now I don't know if that's a good way to necessarily do it, but let's um, let's try. Anybody has a better suggestion at any point, feel free to say something. Okay, so when you distribute it out, cosine cancels from every denominator. So now we've got 1 plus sine over, let's see, 1 plus sine minus cosine squared. Oh, 
I see. Okay. I see what we have to do now. We're actually almost done. It's actually not bad. Everybody with us so far? Anybody recognize anything there? It's, it's a little hard to recognize because it's not all written in the right order. But if we could kind of rearrange a few things in the denominator, we've got something here. Yeah? There's a Pythagorean identity hidden in there. Okay, let me make it a little more obvious where it is. Let's write um, one minus cosine squared plus sine. Does everybody see it now? It's right there. What what is one minus cosine squared? One minus cosine squared change in two. Nick? Sine That's sine squared. So in the top, you've got one plus sine. In the bottom, you've got sine squared plus sine. Now we have two steps left. Okay, the next step, um, you've done this in algebra a lot. We haven't done it today. There's something you can do in the denominator using algebra. Anybody see something you can do there? Yeah? Can you factor out the sign? Exactly. Okay, watch what happens if you factor sign out of the denominator. You get one plus sign in the top. And Nick, can you tell me what that would be me inside the parentheses? No. Keep it in order or switch it so it makes more sense. Um, yeah, I guess just keep it in order and then we'll talk about that. So it would be sine plus one. Sine plus one. Sine times sine is sine squared. Sine times one is sine. Anybody see a common factor that's in both the top and the bottom now? Yeah. Yeah, 1 plus sine, sine plus 1, same thing. It all cancels out. And now in the top, you cancel it out, you're left with a 1. In the bottom, you're left with sine. And what is 1 over sine? Just the cosecant. So this entire thing we started out with, really complicated expression. Really? It's just the cosecant. Okay, so I think I would say we picked a good, a good method. This wasn't too bad. Uh, you could have tried other things, but I, I think this is probably the fastest way to do it. Okay, so that's, that's trig identities. All right, so on um, 407. Okay, have you take a look at 4 through 8, 11 to 13. 18 to 23 and 25 to 30. Okay, it's not it's not very many problems, but some of them are identities, so they might take a little bit of time. Okay, and we'll go over that next time I see you guys.